Wonderful. Um, so with that, um, I'm sure some more folks will join, but I, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So thank you all so much for coming to um, Water Wednesday, our first in this speaker series event. And I, just as a note, we are recording tonight. So we just want to welcome you, everybody, members of the public. Um, this is East Bay Mud's Water Wednesday speaker series. The concept here really is to bring folks in kind of behind the curtain to get an understanding from some of our water experts on various important topics. And today we're talking about drought, both where we're at and what we're trying to do about it. Next month, we're gonna have another one uh, that will be on July 21st, and that is drought part two. We call that, what are you doing about it? And the idea with that one is to talk more about customer conservation, uh, demand reduction, cool tips and ideas like how you can replace your lawn with some beautiful succulents and get paid to do it. Uh, and then in August, we'll have another one of these, that's August 18th, it's always the third Wednesday you might have caught on, and that one is going to be called the other F word, fire prevention in East Bay Mud's watershed. So I know it's kind of a spicy title, but it's a, it's a serious topic, and we think it's one that you benefit a lot from joining. So you can find out more about all those on ebmud.com slash water Wednesday. The details of those next two events are up already. And probably by the end of this week or early next week, we'll have RSVP links there as well for you to join. So keep your eye on those. Going forward, I just want to note again, just to note some more people have joined that we are recording today's meeting. Um, we're going to have two speakers today. First, you'll hear from Dave Briggs, who's our Director of Operations and Maintenance, uh, kind of talking about our current water supply, our reservoir levels, where they're at right now. Um, and then second, you'll hear from Mike Tognolini, who's our Director of Water and Natural Resources. And he'll be talking a little bit about what we're kind of trying to do to combat these issues, to bring in new sources of water, both this year and in the long term, as we plan for, unfortunately, worsening cycles of drought. So again, I'm Ben Glickstein. I think I forgot to introduce myself, the Community Affairs Representative here at East Bay Mud. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dave Briggs, our Director of Operations and Maintenance, to give you a little update on what's going on. Put your questions in the chat because we will address some questions after Dave's presentation that are relevant to his part. And we'll also address some more questions uh, after Mike's section. So if you put your questions in the chat, I'll see them and make sure to read them off. And with that, Dave, take it away. Okay, thank you, Ben, and good evening, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Uh, and once again, I'm Dave Briggs, uh, East Bay Mud, uh, Director of Operations and Maintenance. And I know it's hot out there, and everybody's uh, starting to feel the drought and the hills behind us, uh, including uh, in Ben's background there, which is our McKelmy watershed. They're, they're turning from, from green to brown up there, just as they are down here. Uh, so when we, we try to put our water supply in context and we try to describe uh, to people about water and our water supply and where it comes from, I, I always like to talk about the variability of California hydrology. And it really is variable on, in all sorts of ways. We have wet seasons, we have dry seasons throughout, throughout the year. And then from year to year, we have wet years and dry years. And then really the story of California is that we have variability among sources and water suppliers and even water quality. So there is a lot of variability uh, in all sorts of ways when you talk about California water. And drought is just another one of those cycles that we go through. And depending on how long you've been in California, uh, this might be your sixth or seventh drought as we start uh, you know, through the second year of, of the latest one here. So um, the other, the other facet that's really interesting about being in California and being, uh, being uh, in, in a water supply agency is that we don't live where the water is. Uh, we're a coastal state. Uh, most of the population lives on the coast. Uh, but East Bay Mud and the one point, nearly 1.5 million people that we serve, we are in the Bay Area. We are on the coast. And 90% of our water comes from the Sierra Nevada. And that's a very similar situation for others in the Bay Area. Uh, Marin being the exception, uh, and also Southern California. We, we have all built water systems that, that convey water from the Sierra Nevada um, to the, to the uh, sorry, we'll just wait for the echo to go away there. All right, just one moment here. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, so 
we've built water systems that convey water from the Sierra to our, our populous regions on the coast. And for East Bay Mud, those are 90 mile pipelines that connect the McKellamy watershed to here uh, in the Bay Area, uh, in the, in the East, East Bay Area here. Uh, so 90% of our water comes from uh, the Sierras, 10% is derived from our local watersheds. And uh, so let's get into how dry this year is and how, how, dry, do, how dry is 2021? Uh, how does it rank with uh, the, the other dry years that we've seen in our, in, our, in our history? So I think, Ben, this is the cue for you to pull up the first poll here. Yes, one moment. I'm having my own special technical difficulty, as you might be surprised, <laughs> even though we tested well, this. Minutes well, ago. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. great. I can see it. I can see it. Uh, oh, you can see the poll? Great. Yeah. So you want to read it off or do you want me to do it? Mona, will you go ahead and read that off? Because it's not showing on my screen for, again, mysterious reasons. Okay. What is the driest year on record in our watershed? And we, um, we've got about uh, a few more seconds to the time. So thank you, Mona, for, and just to fill some space here to give people time to, to chime in. So droughts in California, uh, they tend to be on about a 10 year cycle. And we just entered the latest one here. And yes, yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, depending on how long uh, you've been in California, this might be your first drought or it might be your fifth or sixth. Uh, but if we have the results at this point from our participants, we can okay. share the results. Okay. Very good, very good. 1977 is the correct answer. 1977 uh, was the driest year in our watershed and frankly, most parts of Northern California. Uh, and, and that was, uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit. Uh, this year uh, is not quite as bad as 1977 and we'll put it in context with a later slide coming up. But what we're showing here now uh, on the graphic is just a comparison of what Party Reservoir looks like. Uh, in 1976 on the left, you can see how low uh, so Party Reservoir is our main source of supply. It's at an elevation of about 550 feet. It's east of Lodi along the McKellamy River uh, near Jackson. And this reservoir uh, in 1976 was so low that we actually had to install pumps in the, in the lake, uh, the, the, the lake that remained and lift water into the lowest portion of our, of our intake tower, which is shown in the middle of the picture there. Uh, and so it's, this is an extraordinarily low lake level. Uh, and 1977 was actually worse. Uh, and we are in our carryover storage in 2021 is not nearly as bad as it was in 1976 and 77. So it can get a lot worse. Now the photo on the right is a full party reservoir taken from a slightly different angle. And this uh, party reservoir fills about two thirds of the time. So it's, it's, it's more often than not that we get a full reservoir in party. Uh, but in the, the, the most severe two-year drought on record in California, we most certainly did not. And we have not filled our reservoir in 2021 either. We will not fill it. Uh, but the last time it was filled was in 2019, so not that long ago. Okay, um, so now let's look at the next graphic that shows how dry uh, this year has been in our watershed relative to the 10 driest years on record. And as you can see here, 2021 was pretty darn dry and it's lodged about halfway in between 1977 and 1976. And you can also get a sense for how, how devastating the 76, 77 drought was because those years were back to back. And 2020, uh, the year that preceded this year is not in this sort of dubious top 10 list. And that's why uh, one of the reasons why 2021 uh, from an overall uh, water resources perspective was not as bad as the 76, 77 drought. Okay, so let's uh, take our next poll here and look again, just touching back on the variability of our water supplies. And this is true in most uh, semi-arid climates uh, to the west of the Rockies. So Ben, if you could put up the next poll, we'll show and give uh, everybody a chance to uh, weigh in on what they think is the wettest month in our watershed. And this is, this is pretty true for any watershed in the Sierra Nevada. So um, Mona, do you wanna read this again? Okay, historically, what month brings the most precipitation in the McCollum and East Bay watershed? September, November, January, or March? Okay, so if you're a wedding planner or maybe a travel agent, this month might be kind of easy for you. 
Uh, we'll wait for uh, some of the results to come in. Obviously, we have a wetter winter in California than, than we do in the summer, but which, which month is it? And this year would not have been a good year to, uh, uh, to demonstrate this average. Ready for me to stop? Yeah, go ahead, Mona. Let's see. Let's see what we have here. Hey, uh, pretty darn good. Uh, that answer is correct. January is the wettest month for our part of the Sierra Nevada, and also uh, for most parts. Uh, this this January was not very good, uh, but most years, on average, it is. So, so what we're showing here in the graphic is some of those average results for the upper Metellamy watershed, both rain and snow together uh, as a form of, uh, both are forms of precipitation. And as you can see here in the white uh, boxes that are outlined by black, those are the average values uh, in our watershed. And the light blue is what we experienced this year. So January actually was close to average, uh, only because we had an atmospheric river event that was aimed directly at the central uh, uh, Sierra and over our watershed. If it weren't for that one storm event, January would have been about half that uh, much in our watershed and we would have had probably an even more devastating year. But by and large, most of the months, we only had about half the precipitation as the year went, went out. And you also see that on average, we get very little precip over the summer uh, and on the uh, early fall and late spring. And as we approach this spring, you can also see that our, our precipitation, rain and snow uh, that we got in April and May really did start to peter out and we barely got anything in May and nothing in June. So let's look at what we saw locally just for comparison. So again, we get about 10% of our water supply locally. Uh, so uh, this does not typically contribute a lot to our water supply, but it is very relevant to helping us keep our demand down. So the more it rains locally, it does fill our local reservoirs, but it also uh, helps irrigate people's landscaping so they don't uh, reach for their irrigation controller and uh, do it courtesy of uh, East Bay Mud Supply. They let Mother Nature do it. Uh, but the story in the East Bay was, was the driest that we have on record. We got no year uh, other than 2021. 2021 was the driest year uh, that we have on record in the, our East Bay watersheds. It was 35% of average, uh, very, very dry. And if you walk around the Bay Area and you look at some of the trees and the parks and you can see how stressed they are, you can tell how, year, how dry this year has been and how dry last year was as well. So now let's uh, transition to Let's see. Oh, yeah. So before we get to the next slide, Ben, um, let me just uh, set it up by saying, uh, so as, as we accumulated all of this water in our watershed, um, our board of directors uh, was keeping very close tabs of the situation. And in a board meeting in late April, the board declared a stage one drought based on the water supplies that we had on hand and what we forecasted the water supplies to be by the end of the water year, which is September 30th. And at that time in the spring, we were forecasting that we would have about 475,000 acre feet of water in our cumulative storage uh, upcountry and here in the Bay Area. Um, now, an acre foot of water represents about 325,000 gallons, and it also represents an acre one foot deep in water. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how much water that is. But we, in that number, 475,000 acre feet, which is what we thought we'd have when we ended the water year, that may not mean much to the general person, but that's a very meaningful number for us here at East Bay Mud, because that is our trigger for beginning to get into our drought mode when we start to look at supplemental supplies and rationing and, um, and declaring uh, uh, various stages of drought. So that's a very important number. Um, also, our, our entire system, when it is full, is 770,000 acre feet of water. So 475 is about 60, 61% of being full. Uh, we still have a lot of water in storage. And this year, we have ample supplies. All of the things that I'm going to talk about next and that Mike's going to talk about are really uh, setting us up in case next year or the year after remains dry. In other words, if we get into a prolonged drought, what can, we be do, what can we be doing now this summer to mitigate the severity of a drought if this is prolonged? Um, 
one other nuance I would mention is that even though we predicted in the spring that we would end our water year storage at 475,000 acre feet, because of the, the dryness of the spring and the inability of that snowpack to melt and run off and create water in our watersheds, uh, we did not get as much runoff as we thought from the little bit of snowpack that we had accumulated and our projections were off. And it turns out that we are only gonna end this water year with about 425,000 acre feet of water storage, which is 50,000 less than we thought uh, earlier in the spring. And one of the reasons for that, one of the main reasons is just the snowpack that we had, it just did not turn into river flow. Uh, most likely it was all consumed by plants and trees or possibly evaporation, uh, but many water suppliers were uh, surprised at how little runoff we got uh, from our snow during the spring as it played out. So let's look at um, how our board of directors navigates its way through a drought by looking at this slide here. And it really is sort of a, 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 a cartoon of our policy. And there's a lot here, so I'll walk through it slowly. Um, on the far left are, are gradations of carryover storage. <laughs> so in other words, how much storage we have carrying over into the next water year, which ends September 30th and begins on October 1st. So you can see that we start to have conversations about droughts at about 475,000 acre feet of carryover storage, which is the delineation between a stage zero or normal conditions and a stage one moderate drought, which is what we're in right now. And as you can see, uh, the gradations keep getting lower and lower and lower, representing lower amounts of reservoir storage. And just for reference, I, I mentioned that our carryover storage this year is probably going to be near 425,000 acre feet, but it has been a lot worse in prior droughts. In 2015, the carryover storage was in the low 300s. That was the last drought uh, we experienced. And then in 1977, believe it or not, it was about 250,000 acre feet of carryover storage. So we are low in our storage, but, uh, by, uh, but we have definitely seen more severe droughts than we're experiencing right now. So just to give a little bit more description about what else is in this uh, graphic here, you can see that as the drought uh, increases in severity, we begin to start looking at supplemental supplies. When our watershed can't produce enough, uh, we start to look elsewhere to make sure that the burden on our customers and our industries uh, and our commercial uh, customers is not too great. And since we have uh, declared a stage one drought, we are now working on a supplemental supply, which Mike will talk about in more details. And also uh, on the far right there, you can see what the customer response uh, should be. In other words, what can you do about this to help us and to help the state get through the drought. And where we are right now as a stage one drought, we are asking customers to voluntarily conserve and to cut back about 10%. Now, if the drought gets worse next year, the board will reserve the right to increase the severity of the drought and that will by and large be triggered by the amount of carryover storage we have. So that could happen, uh, but it remains to be seen uh, and it will depend on how wet the fall and the winter are. So I know Ben uh, talked about a future uh, 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 presentation that will include water conservation and will give uh, customers and anybody that wants to attend more tips on what you can do to help us out. Uh, I believe there's ample information on our website uh, if you want to get more information there. And with uh, that, Ben, I will pause to see if there's any questions and otherwise get Mike all warmed up in the bullpen here. Thanks, Dave. Uh, that was very enlightening. Um, I appreciate that. And I don't yet see any questions in the chat. So again, folks who are listening in, if you have any questions you've heard yet right now about our reservoir supply storage, uh, what it means for you, do feel free to put those in the chat and we can have Dave answer them or you can think about that a little more, put them in the chat and we'll read them off after Mike's presentation as well. I do see, okay, we just got one from John H who asks, um, Let's see, is there sharing of water supply between EV Mud and other Bay or California counties? Yeah, it's a good question because right now uh, with the severity of the drought statewide, and I, I didn't, I probably didn't mention this well enough earlier, but um, in, in that whole variability conversation about how different water systems have different supplies and different infrastructure, 
Right now, there are most definitely water suppliers who are in far worse shape than East Bay Mud customers, uh, namely in the North Bay um, and Southern California. Um, and some are, of course, better, some are worse. But when we get to this level of emergency in, in water resources, yes, sharing does happen and people get very creative. And there are inner ties between many of our, uh, the water suppliers that supply the Bay Area and elsewhere. And we, are, we have the physical ability to share water and to carry water from a source that someone can find uh, and deliver it to them through our mutual uh, infrastructure, getting it from source to the customer. Um, so it is really remarkable what happens uh, in a severe drought. And probably uh, the, the best example is uh, you know, during the 1977 drought, a pipeline was put on the San Rafael Bridge and East Bay Mud conveyed water uh, from a third party source to Marin County. Uh, and that could happen next year. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of sharing. Uh, usually uh, people identify uh, their own water and then other people, the water agencies just participate in carrying that water to customers. Thank you, Dave. Um, and then this other question, I think you've kind of answered here, which uh, is in answering that question, which is how does East Bay Mud compare to how other water agencies are doing in this area in terms of drought? I think you kind of got that yeah. one already. Is there anything else you want to add? We do have a couple more to get to. Um, let's see, we've got uh, a question from Laura who's kind of asking, oh no, sorry. Uh, we've got a question from Linda who's asking, if there's any policies that we recommend or that we're working with on local cities or um, lo local control to pass in terms of this drought, do we have any interface with cities or counties uh, on, on topics that would help with water conservation? I don't know, that might be one from, my, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think that Mike would probably be better able to answer that. So let's just save that one for him. Let's, let's hold that and, and I'll come back to it. Um, there's a question, this one probably uh, from Laura will be better answered if you can come next month in July, but you might have an answer for this, Dave. The question is kind of, um, if folks are cutting back on water now due to voluntary conservation, will that affect, or will they be in effect sort of penalized if they have to cut back into this stage two drought when we then go to a 15% reduction or not? Yeah, so that's the question that comes on us every drought cycle. And usually there's a benchmark year that reduction is measured against. So you're not penalized by great behavior this year. Oh, great. Okay. So that's the benchmark is like, we haven't set that yet, but say it's like how much water you used in 2015, not how much water you used last month. Correct. Oh, Correct. That's not finish. quite, not quite that far back, yeah. but yeah. 20, okay. Recent, Some year. year. Yeah. Okay. That, that's helpful. Um, I hope that answered your question, Laura. Um, we've got a question. How much water does the average East Bay Mud customer use each day? I think, yeah, Mike might have a better number, uh, but I believe it's uh, somewhere, is it around 50 or 60? Okay, uh, yeah, usually we measure that in gallons per day per capita. Um, I believe it's somewhere in the 50 or 60 range. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, that's great. I think that's better than the national average, right? So I've heard, um, but we'll see. Uh, let's, not, let's not put commit to that on this call. Uh, okay, a couple other inquiries. We do have some questions pouring in now. I knew they would come. Um, Patricia asks, do you see us moving to that stage two or more specifically that mandatory conservation in this year or is it more likely to happen next year? I, I think the board will reserve all options, uh, but I do not foresee us moving to a stage two drought in the next few months. Okay. Um, let's see. And then we've got an inquiry that's basically just asking, and again, Susan, uh, Sarah, this is probably one that you'll get a lot more uh, sort of insight into if you come to next month's presentation. But the question is just, why aren't some of these conservations mandatory in, for customers in general, kind of year round from here on out, given the fact that we do foresee with climate change and, and greater um, droughts, you know, why, I guess, do we wait to droughts before we start talking about conservation measures? Yeah, I, I think there's, you know, there's probably no easy answer to that. Uh, uh, but uh, our customers have done a great job. And I mean, the, the last drought was just not that long ago. And yeah. our water use today is a lot lower than it was in the 70s and the 80s on a per capita basis. Um, the customers have done a great job. And yes, we could, we could be more, uh, uh, I guess, more rigid about it and mandate conservation. But the, the, factor, the fact of the matter is people are doing a great job already. But if it does come to that, if, if we're not making ends meet, 
then that's the next lever to pull. Thanks, Dave. And I'll highlight for that um, question as well that while there aren't certainly a lot of mandatory restrictions in place year to year, we do have a really robust water conservation program that's occurring every single year. And folks are taking advantage of things, for example, you know, rebates, um, audits in their home and things like that. So folks are really working towards these conservation goals, even in kind of off years or wet years, I would say. And we've seen good results from that. <clears throat> we'll just do one more question and then we're gonna go to the second part of our, um, well, actually this question is something Mark asks that I think Mike will get into a little bit, which is what would the response be to an extended multi-year drought? He says, i.e. a mega drought. And again, what are we doing to prepare for such a situation? I think that's a perfect segue to Mike. Yeah, that sounds great. I agree with that. So with that said, um, Mike is gonna join. Oh, I see him on the, on the video right now. And I'm just gonna introduce Mike Tognolini again. He's our director of water and natural resources. He's gonna be telling us a little bit about what it is we're gonna be doing uh, going forward to plan for these kind of scary scenarios, the fact that we're just seeing more and more drought these days. Mike, take it away. All right, thank you, Ben. And thank you, Dave. Oh, can you turn down your volume, Dave? All right, um, uh, great to have such interest in this topic today and, and uh, happy to be with you tonight and to talk a little bit more about our, uh, kind of our long-term water supply planning and our alternative sources. Dave spent some time sharing with you all uh, a bit about our, our main source of water, the McKellamy River, as well as our local watershed in the East Bay where we do get runoff and we do treat and deliver water from our East Bay reservoirs as well. But in those years when, we, we, when we're in a drought, uh, we, in addition to asking our customers to conserve, we also uh, bring in sources of supply from other locations. And uh, the one in particular that I'm gonna talk about first tonight is uh, our Freeport Regional Water Project. And that's a project that East Bay Mud completed in 2011, and it allows us to access water from the Sacramento River um, and utilize water from a federal contract that we have with the Federal Bureau of Reclamation and its project that's called the Central Valley Project. And that project, the Central Valley Project, delivers water to farmers in the Central Valley and urban agencies like East Bay Mud it also delivers water to Silicon Valley and uh, Contra Costa Water District. So Concord, uh, Brentwood, Martinez area as well. So um, uh, just like East Bay Mud, the Central Valley project has seen uh, pretty dramatic reductions in water availability because of the drought. We didn't get the, the uh, rainfall and snowfall that we would normally expect. And as a result, they've had to cut back as well. So. Um, they recently told us that we're, um, instead of getting our full contract amount, we're only getting about 25% of that contract. And that corresponds to a number, which is 33,000 acre feet. And an acre foot is the amount of water it takes to cover an acre, roughly a football field with a, with a, a foot deep in water. So that 33,000 acre feet is the equivalent for us of about 20% of the amount of water that we need to serve uh, the East Bay this year. So we'll get about 20% from the Sacramento River. The rest will come from our, our main sources that we, we've spoken about, the McCallamy River and our East Bay runoff. Um, the Freeport project, as I said, was built in 2011 and the cost to East Bay mud was over $500 million in order to take, divert that water near the city of Sacramento and pump it uh, all the way to the East Bay. So it does take quite a bit of pumping to make that happen, which is different than our normal system, which flows by gravity from the Sierras. So there's a, a pumping cost element that's added to the uh, cost to deliver water during a drought that, that we pulled into our, our uh, plans. Um, but if, nevertheless, we're really fortunate to have the Freeport Regional Water Project available and water available from the Central Valley Project to um, really diversify our sources of supply during a drought. And, um, as a result, uh, you may notice a difference in, in the taste of the water, uh, especially if you're more sensitive. You, you may have been drinking one source of water for many years and um, Sacramento River water tastes a little different. So you may notice a difference in that. It doesn't mean that it's any less healthy. In fact, all of our water is safe to drink and the water that we get from the Sacramento River will be as well, but it has a different mineral content than the water that you're used to. 
So you may see it, uh, notice a difference in taste if you're particularly sensitive to that. Uh, so uh, at this point, I wanna hand it over to our associate civil engineer, Yipei Shi, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about more about the Freeport project, which, make, which makes it possible for us to divert water from other sources beyond the McKellamy River. Hi, my name is Yipei Shi, Associate Civil Engineer with East Bay Mud. Today, we're going to visit the Freeport Regional Water Project. Come on with me. Driving exit here on Freeport Boulevard. Welcome to the Freeport oh. Regional Water Project intake structure. In 2002, East Bay Mud began a partnership with the Sacramento County Water Agency to design, construct, and operate this project. The red star is the location of the Freeport Regional Water Project intake facility. It's located on the bank of the Sacramento River, about 10 miles downstream from downtown Sacramento and one mile upstream from the city of Freeport. Water is pumped from the intake through the transmission pipeline. Next, a one mile pipe splits off to allow a portion of the water to flow to the Sacramento County Water Treatment Plant, while the rest continues to the Folsom South Canal. Water discharges from the pipeline into the canal where it travels 14 miles to our clay station pumping plant. The water then flows by pipeline to our Comanche pump station and into our large aqueduct pipes, which bring the water to local reservoirs in the East Bay. So here's a view of the intake structure looking upstream. Yolo County here is across the river. The pocket neighborhood here in Sacramento is right adjacent to the intake station. You can um, note this four acre buffer area with these little landscape berms that's located between the intake structure and the neighborhood. This water tower to the right of the intake station is owned and operated by the city of Sacramento and is not part of the facilities. You can also see from here, the three sedimentation basins and four surge protection tanks. Here's a closer look at the top of the intake structure which is designed actually to resemble a salmon swimming upstream. So let's take a quick aerial tour of the facilities. Here we're flying over the three sedimentation basins and our central plaza, the river wall and the intake structure. Fun fact, it was actually built on top of an existing flood control levee. We couldn't put a bathroom in here because any water coming in or out has to be pumped up and over the levee. Over here on the reverse side, you can see the large fish greens. These vertical poles are to keep larger debris from collecting at the screens. Now we're looking inside to see the two large interior four bays where sediment gets settled out to keep it from getting into these transmission pipelines. The water is then pumped into the transmission system. The Freeport Regional Water Project features state-of-the-art fish screens. The screens protect small fish, specifically delta smelt and juvenile salmonids, from entering the pumps. The entire screen system is 160 feet long by nearly 11 feet high. The screens are made of stainless steel wedge wire. The openings between the wires are 69 hundredths of an inch wide. Here, you can see some of the smaller delta smelts are about the size of a house key and cannot get in through these slats. So the river wall is 220 foot long public art space. Text from poems from 14 international authors are on the wall and all of them are related to rivers. This artwork was created by San Francisco artist Paul Koss. The wall was designed to emphasize the fact that at this point in the river, flows can go both ways due to tidal influence. Thanks for visiting the Freeport Regional Water Project. I hope this helps you visualize an important piece of the infrastructure that East Bay Mud relies on for supplemental drought supply.
All right, thank you, Ipe. And uh, really, that's just a quick view of the Freeport Regional Water Project, which is really a cornerstone project in delivering a water supply for uh, drought reliability to the East Bay. Um, it's built uh, in large part in partnership with the Sacramento County Water Authority and the city of Sacramento. The Sacramento County Water Authority actually also uh, uses that facility uh, for some of its own diversions. So I uh, wanted to talk now looking forward beyond our current drought and what things might look like in the future. You know, five, 10, 20 years from now, we're always planning ahead for uh, um, continuing uh, uncertainty around water supply, be it drought, be it climate change, et cetera. We want to have as resilient a water supply portfolio as we possibly can. So Freeport will always be a big part of that. But in addition to that, I want to talk a little bit about some other things that we're doing. The first one that I want to talk about is something we call the dream project. And I guess um, uh, one fun thing about being in the water business is you, you get to make up fun names for projects. And this is this one in particular we call the dream project, which stands for demonstration, recharge, extraction, and aquifer management. And this has to do with, with uh, storing water underground when we have excess water available and then uh, accessing that water uh, during dry periods when we need more water. This particular photo just shows some of the agricultural lands. These are, um, uh, this, these are almond trees. And in the, the foreground of this photo, you'll see what looks like a dirt road, but what is actually the McKelmy Aqueduct. These are the underground pipelines that take the water from the McKelmy River from Pardee Reservoir and deliver then, transmit them across the Central Valley and through the Delta and ultimately to the East Bay as our drinking water. So um, the, the, uh, um, the demonstration recharge ex ex extraction and aquifer management project or the DREAM project is a partnership between East Bay Mud, San Joaquin County, North San Joaquin Water Conservation District and the Eastern Water Alliance. And what it uh, is uh, intended to do and what it's, it's doing in, in the demonstration phase now is to uh, take extra water from the McKelmy River that East Bay Mud has that it can't store in its reservoirs, uh, deliver that water uh, to the agricultural fields near in this part of the of the, the valley near our aqueducts. And that allows some of the farmers to uh, use that water to irrigate their crops rather than pumping groundwater as they normally would. And since the groundwater basin in this area is overdrawn, that allows the groundwater to recover, to, uh, to recharge um, in response to the fact that there's not as much pumping needed by these local farmers. The, the arrangement then is that East Bay Mud and San Joaquin County farmers really share in that benefit. So some of the water is left for uh, recovery of the, of the groundwater basin. And some of that water is then held in storage and made available to East Bay Mud when it would need it during a drought. So this is called groundwater banking. You're taking water in wet periods putting it in the bank, so to speak, and making it available when you might need it during a drought. And this is a concept project that we have at a very small scale now. And the idea would be that this is something we could expand to a much larger scale in the future. The amount of storage that's available underground in San Joaquin County is far greater than some of the reservoirs that we're, we're currently relying on. So there's quite a bit of storage potentially available. So just to, uh, again, to emphasize, it's really an ideal partnership because it improves sustainability for uh, San Joaquin County, but it also improves water supply reliability for an urban area. And in our case, for East Bay Mud customers in Alameda and Contra Costa County. All right, I wanted to now move on to another type of, of project that's really important when it comes to um, uh, drought supplies. And that's really making the most of the water that we already have. And in this case, uh, I'm referring to recycled water, uh, which is another way uh, to um, take water, use it for non-drinking purposes, and save potable drinking water for our customers. So recycled water is highly treated wastewater that's safe for a variety of uses. And in our service area, we primarily use it for uh, landscape irrigation and for industrial purposes. And um, I would say that in other parts of the state, not in the East Bay, it's uh, also being used for, um, uh, it's being purified to an even higher degree 
for, uh, for drinking purposes, although that's not currently planned in the East Bay. Uh, but it is something that we're, we keep tabs on, and at some point, uh, it, it may become something that we consider uh, down the road. Uh, East Bay Mud currently has the capacity to treat and deliver about 9 million gallons per day of recycled water, and that saves enough drinking water to supply uh, the needs of over 100,000 people in the East Bay. So that, that alone is a significant uh, way that we're able to conserve and make the most of water and save that precious resource for our customers. Uh, just as a small example, we just connected the Canyon Lakes Golf Course to recycle water last month. And that, uh, that particular golf course uh, would result in us saving about 50 million gallons of drinking water per year for, for East Bay Mud customers. Uh, and recycled water is very popular. Uh, in, uh, we have a partnership with the Dublin San Ramon Services District that operates a wastewater plant in the Dublin Pleasanton area. And during hot summer days, we're using every drop of wastewater from that plant and recycling it for um, irrigation purposes in the San Ramon and Dublin areas. So um, as I mentioned, we're using about 9 million gallons per day of uh, recycled water now. And our plan, our board's plan is to uh, grow that recycled water capacity up to 20 million gallons per day. So more than double it by the year 2040 as part of our overall portfolio of solutions to meeting our, our long-term water supply uh, reliability needs. So those are just a few of the ways that East Bay Mud's preparing for droughts. Um, you know, we emphasize regional partnerships, uh, programs that, that are mutually beneficial and sustainable. Uh, we're looking at recycled water, groundwater storage, uh, water transfers are another element of our program that that we're um, that we're pursuing. Um, so, if, if you'd like to learn more about our entire water supply portfolio, uh, you can find out more in East Bay Mud's uh, Urban Water Management Plan, which is available on our website. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ben to answer any additional questions. All right, thank you so much, Mike. I uh, really appreciate the presentation. And we do have some questions lined up for you. Let's see. Um, so these are some interesting ones. The first one is about storage capacity, right? It seems like storage in our reservoirs may be a limiting factor in, in many years. So, you know, what are we doing to talk about just developing more basically water storage capacity? Uh, it looks like my camera's frozen. Oh, there I go. There you go. You can hear me. Um, uh, we do have storage elements to our long-term water supply portfolio. I mentioned the groundwater basin already. The DREAM project is an example of one way that we can store water in wet years for use in dry years. So uh, that uh, offers some opportunities for us for drought supply. Another surface water storage program that our board is considering is participation in uh, an expansion of Los Piqueros Reservoir, uh, which is near Brentwood. That reservoir is currently operated by Contra Costa Water District, and they're considering uh, making it larger, making a larger dam, and creating additional storage. And East Bay Muds Board is has been involved in the studies and evaluations of that reservoir and is uh, considering whether or not to participate uh, and actually um, um, obtain some of the new storage that's developed out of that project. So that's another example. Great. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple of questions rolling in about recycled water. One just asking if you can tell more about our plans to increase both supply and provision of recycled water. And then another asking if we do think we'll get it to that, to serving it at that drinking level in the future. Okay, so um, I mentioned that it, it is our plan to increase our recycled water capacity from 9 million gallons per day up to 20 million gallons per day. And we've identified a number of projects that will achieve that goal. Uh, we have certain locations where we're using every drop of wastewater. That includes, as I mentioned, Dublin, uh, San Ramon area, as well as actually West, West Contra Costa County, uh, where we deliver water to um, the, the Richmond refinery. Um, there are other wastewater plants where there is excess uh, flow available, including East Bay Mud's wastewater plant in Oakland. And we have, at this point, a a project in place. We're treating wastewater and delivering it for landscape irrigation in Oakland and Emeryville. 
with plans to expand to Berkeley and Alameda, and I think as far up as Albany. Um, and that's just one example of an expansion project that we have planned. Another would be uh, that we do have one other um, a large water user in Rodeo, the, the Phillips 66 refinery, although they're gonna be changing their processes, they still have a significant water demand that we think we're gonna be offset, able to offset some of it with recycled water. So that's in the works as well. As to the question about uh, <clears throat> what, what's called potable reuse, taking highly purified water as a drinking water source, our board did an initial evaluation of it and did not include it in our plan out to the year 2040 for, uh, at this point for a, a, a number of reasons. Uh, one, we have a lot of other water supply alternatives that we're still considering. I mentioned storage, partnerships, water transfers. So we have a lot of other uh, tools in the toolbox, so to speak, that we're, we're considering that may be lower cost or lower energy. Because when you're talking about purification of wastewater for drinking, it's very energy intensive. So um, when we consider things like uh, power costs, greenhouse gas generation, those kind of factors, other alternatives may, um, may pencil out a little better. But so that's one reason. Another is that the state is still working through some of the regulations related to how uh, potable reuse would work, how, how uh, drinking tr uh, treated uh, purified water would be um, uh, permitted and um, made uh, and ensured to be safe for the public. Some of those rules aren't quite finalized yet. So we're kind of in a wait and see mode when it comes to that particular technology. Thank you, Mike. This one is um, from Contra Costa Climate <clears throat> and it's a little more detailed. It's asking about whether cities should receive, different individual cities in our service area should receive some kind of incentives or penalties if they're not doing their part when it comes to sort of incentivizing water, wise water use in their own service areas. Um, and whether we have maybe a role in that kind of, uh, of, a, of a policy or conceptualization. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's a really interesting policy question. And I would say that um, at first, uh, at, at the very basic level, and this is something our board has already mentioned, most in the most recent uh, board meetings in the last couple of months is that when we're asking our customers to cut back and conserve, we need to make sure that some of these, um, some of the irrigators, uh, the larger irrigators also do so. And that includes city parks, city landscape areas, um, homeowners associations. So that, that, cut, that group of customers needs special attention. They should be setting the example when it comes to conservation. Uh, when it comes to policies, um, I would uh, say that um, East Bay Mud has its own ability to enforce um, um, excessive, what we call an excessive use ordinance. So we have the ability to set uh, standards of, of use for customers across our entire service area during a very severe drought. They're not, they're not in play during a stage one drought. But as we get into deeper stages of drought, East Bay Mud has the ability to set um, um, requirements. And if, if for people that are excessive in their use of water, they can then be penalized um, uh, through that ordinance process. So that way we can kind of establish a, a, a regional um, consistency rather than having one city do one thing and another city do another thing and everyone kind of piecemeals different approaches East Bay Mud has its own capability of, of establishing ordinances with respect to how we would um, uh, enforce um, uh, appropriate water use. Thanks, yeah, right, we're our own government agency. So um, that's very helpful. What, going back to kind of what you were talking about when we talked about potable reuse and, and um, sort of new sources and the power it takes to treat them. We have a couple of questions coming in about what piece desalination might play in our puzzle. Uh, every drought, uh, the question of desalination comes up and it's a, it's a good question. It's, um, it is something that we've considered before and it is part of our, our, our um, a list of possible projects that we may pursue in the future. It's not today at the top of the list. 
it kind of falls in line behind a few other things, but it is out there. And, you know, depending on what happens with climate change, with increased drought severity, it could rise to the top. Uh, some of the advantages of desalination are that um, it, it's available at a location near us. Obviously, we, we're surrounded by salt water. Um, uh, some of the challenges of desalination uh, are, again, the cost to treat salt water and make it fresh and drinkable, the, uh, and the energy use that's associated with that, which leads to greenhouse gas emissions and and we are certainly trying to manage from a climate policy perspective what our supplemental supply programs uh, look like. So um, there are advantages and challenges to that. And, and the cost is, um, it's in the ballpark of some of our other supplies, but say something like water transfers that would rely on our existing report project where we've already built the infrastructure. Those are gonna be a lower cost alternative typically than the desalination program. So it's, I, I would just say desalination is on our list. It's, it's hasn't been fully dismissed, but it's not in that top group of programs that we're um, uh, aggressively pursuing today. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, always taking into account the greenhouse gas emissions and the cost of any of these projects for all of our customers. But um, with that said, I think there's no more questions in the in the chat except this one, and I think it's a fun one to end on for you. You kind of tackled it a little bit talking about some of the big projects we're looking at, but the question from Patricia is is basically, you know, we heard about how Freeport Project was this huge investment, you know, that that our customers helped us invest in that's really set us up well for the, the drought. And Patricia asks, what's the next Freeport Project for East Bay Mud? <laughs> if you have one that you kind of have your eye on with that same you know, that that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I could answer it with a single project. I, our objective is to pursue multiple additional sources of supply. Some of them will hit unexpected roadblocks along the way. Others will move forward. And that's how we ended up with the Freeport project. We had a list of, of uh, projects that we were pursuing all at once. And Freeport was the one that was able to advance to where they came online. I would say that uh, some of the projects I've already mentioned, that, that groundwater storage project has great promise. Right now it's a, a small pilot you know, demonstrations uh, stage, but that could be expanded uh, pretty significantly. Uh, the Los Vaqueros storage project is another. Uh, and then the sources of supply. Um, uh, we have a couple of water transfer partners that we've been working with for many years and are looking to establish a long-term relationship that really would provide some assurance that we would have enough water to, to, to pump through the Freeport project. So I don't think, I don't know that I can see any project of the scale of a $500 million East Bay Mud investment on water supply reliability. We have many other infrastructure investments of that scale that are extremely important that we accomplish. But uh, in terms of our water supply reliability, Freeport's gonna carry us for a while and we're gonna be able to add to that uh, maybe at a, a little smaller scale, but uh, certainly important increments, important increases to our uh, water supply resilience. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and thank you, Dave. That's all the questions we have in the chat for today. And I appreciate everyone sticking around. We had a great audience today, some great questions. So I just want to summarize before we say goodbye to everyone that uh, this was our first of this Water Wednesday speaker series events. We're gonna have one every third Wednesday of the month, at least for the next couple months and probably going forward from there. So I'm putting my email in the chat right now. If folks have feedback, questions, even recommendations for potential events, uh, you can uh, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, just as a heads up, we got the two more scheduled that I'll remind you about on July 21st. This is the one that's gonna be about water conservation, what you can do at home and at businesses, we're calling it, what are you gonna do about it? It's a, and then on August 18th, we're gonna be doing, again, another kind of spicy title, the other F word, fire prevention in the watershed. So uh, those are gonna be really interesting topics. Find out more about them on our website at edmud.com slash water Wednesday. Um, and if you have any more questions, again, my email is in the chat. We've really appreciated sharing this hour with you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay,
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.